All right, we're going to try to finish up chapter two today. The next two churches are linked in uh, Christ's critique of them. And so we're going to go ahead and put them together as well. Starting in chapter, or sorry, chapter two, starting in uh, verse 12. To the angel of the church in Ephesus write, the words of him who holds the seven stars in his right hand, who walks among the seven golden lampstands. I know your works, your toil, and your patient endurance, and how you cannot bear with those who are evil, but have tested those who call themselves apostles and are not, and have found them to be false. I know you are enduring patiently and bearing up for my name's sake, and you have not grown weary. But I have this against you, that you have abandoned the love you had at first. Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen. Repent and do the works you did at first. If not, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place, unless you repent. Yet this you have. You hate the works of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To the one who conquers, I will grant to eat of the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. And to the angel of the church in Smyrna write, the words of the first and the last who died and came to life. I know your tribulation and your poverty, but you are rich, and the slander of those who say that they are Jews and are not, but are a synagogue of Satan. Do not fear what you are about to suffer. Behold, the devil is about to throw some of you into prison, that you may be tested, and for ten days you will have tribulation. Be faithful unto death, and I will give you the crown of life." He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. The one who conquers will not be hurt by the second death. And to the angel of the church in Pergamum write, The words of him who has the sharp two-edged sword. I know where you dwell, where Satan's throne is. Yet you hold fast my name, and you did not deny my faith. Even in the days of Antipas, my faithful witness, who was killed among you, where Satan dwells. But I have a few things against you. You have some there who hold to the teaching of Balaam, who taught Balak to put a stumbling block before the sons of Israel, so that they might eat food sacrificed to idols and practice sexual immorality. So also you have some who hold the teaching of the Nicolaitans. Therefore repent. If not, I will come to you soon and war against them with the sword of my mouth." He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To the one who conquers, I will give some of the hidden manna, and I will give him a white stone with a new name written on the stone, that no one knows except the one who receives it. And to the angel of the church in Thyatira write, The words of the Son of God, who has eyes like a flame of fire, and whose feet are burnished like bronze. I know your works, your love, and faith, and service, and patient endurance, and that your latter works exceed the first. But I have this against you, that you tolerate that woman Jezebel, who calls herself a prophetess, and is teaching and seducing my servants to practice immorality and to eat food sacrificed to idols. I gave her time to repent, but she refuses to repent of her sexual immorality." Behold, I will throw her onto a sickbed, and those who commit adultery with her I will throw into great tribulation, unless they repent of her works, and I will strike her children dead. And all the churches will know that I am he who searches mind and heart, and I will give to each of you according to your works. But to the rest of you in Thyatira, who do not hold this teaching, who have not learned what some call the deep things of Satan, to you I say, I do not lay on you any other burden. Only hold fast what you have until I come. The one who conquers and who keeps my works until the end, to him I will give authority over the nations, and he will rule them with a rod of iron, as when earthen pots are broken in pieces, even as I myself has, have received authority from my Father, and I will give him the morning star, he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Um, so back up to verse 12, Pergamum. Um, how does Christ identify himself here? As what? Yeah, the one who uh, has the sharp two-edged sword. 
And then later he says that with the people he has a problem with, he's going to actually come and war against them, right? With the sword of his mouth. So what does the sword represent? Is it a literal sword? What is the sword that he's talking about? What is the judgment throughout these letters that, that Christ is warning them is going to happen if they don't repent? Yeah, to remove their lampstand. In other words, excommunication. But excommunication from the invisible church, not just the visible church. So excommunication, that's, that's the threat right there. Christ is the one who actually has the right to excommunicate from his invisible church if there isn't repentance. Now, what does he say is good about this church? What have they done well? Yeah, so under persecution, they endured it, right? They Rather than um, actually uh, reject Christ, they were willing to die. They even have a martyr among them, Antipas, who died, who was killed for the faith. So they've done well in that regard. Um, they live where he says where Satan dwells. Now, this could be a reference to a couple things. First, it could be a reference because there is a, a serpent deity in Pergamum that is worshipped. And it could be that that big serpent that John sees in the city or saw in the city reminded him of the devil. Because, of course, he calls the devil that later. He's the serpent of old, all that sort of thing. Uh, we spoke last week how it could be the fact that there's like a giant throne of Zeus. Zeus being the, you know, the imperial god. Um. I think that's probably it, but I think there's maybe one more thing here that I, I think John is maybe trying to say, which is I think he's taking a dig at Rome and saying, because that's, that's what he's going to identify later, right? Where does Satan actually dwell? What, what, is, what is Satan giving power to? Well, it's to the Roman Empire. It's to the Caesar. Um, and so ultimately he's saying Satan dwells where? Well, he dwells in Rome and Rome's cities. And that's why Christians are persecuted and killed. Because the idea ultimately is, is that if you are people of light and you live in a place that is darkness, those two cannot abide together for very long without one trying to destroy the other. And of course, because our means are not physical in nature, we're not, we don't have an army, we're not coming against you know, our country to try to take it over or anything like that. Uh, we're, we're trying to take it over through spiritual means, through the gospel. They're the ones with the army, so if they don't like that, they can just kill us. And that's what's occurring here. And so I, I think that's why he's saying this is where Satan's throne is. Throne is the place from which you rule your authority. You would think, well, that would be Rome, not Pergamum. But again, if he's trying to actually say something about Rome through Pergamum, it makes sense. And it also gives us understanding that all Christians in Rome are in trouble. Um, now, again, you might be like, well, that's a historical thing. They were in trouble. I would argue you're in Rome. <laughs> this is Rome. I mean, literally, this is the, uh, we are the descendants of the Roman Empire in America. America really is that empire basically in the modern age. Our, our religion and our ethics are Greco-Roman. But even in terms of where, where was the Holy Roman? Like you had the Roman Empire and that fell, but then you had the Holy Roman Empire and that continued on through what? Through what? Well, through Catholicism, which was mainly physically where? In, well, that's true. Think, think of a little bit bigger. Well, the Roman Catholic Empire was not in Constantinople. You guys are, come on. Well, it was a Byzantine Empire. <laughs> that was a Byzantine Empire, yes. So that was the Holy Roman Empire that, that continued on. But then from there, it took fruition in what Europe. continent? Europe. And we are what? We're a European colony. Um, so literally, we are this. And now we, we had a little bit of a rest because uh, we convinced people that, hey, you're Christian. Uh, you're a Christian nation, even though they weren't. 
they're really an enlightenment nation and with enlightenment principles and enlightenment religion, but there was a syncretism of Christianity. So they're like, oh, we'll leave the Christians alone because we're all Christians. But now people realize they're not really Christians and they don't actually like Christians. We're going to be turning back into the Roman Empire real quick and we're going to see a lot more persecution and death. As soon as this younger generation that cannot stand our religion or our ethics come to power, that's going to be it. You of the older generation, you probably won't see it. You, the, the generation now, the Biden generation, they're not going to see it. They're, it's not going to happen then. But as soon as the younger generation, the kids in college, you go up and ask them about like Christian theology and ethics or whatever, it's wicked to them. It's evil. It's an evil to be purged. It's like it's like Pol Pot language. Um, you know, it's it's the Khmer Rouge type stuff. You're going to see this all over again because we are in a dark place and we are people of light. And so Christ has said, these Christians, they stood firm in the days when they were actually being barraged, in the days when they had a, 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 a martyr themselves, um, which he probably was an elder in a church. That's probably why he's prominent. I'm sure other people have died too, but he's probably the best known. So John mentions him. But they did really, really well. And you would think, well, but that's all there really is about Christianity right there, just standing firm in the persecution, right? But then Christ says, I have a few things against you, though. What does he have against them? Okay, now I actually think that this is the same thing. So what, what he actually says is, uh, there are those who hold the teaching of Balaam, who taught Balak to put a stumbling block before the sons of Israel so that they might eat food sacrificed to idols and practice sexual immorality. Remember those two things, because it's going to come out in the next church too. Um, so likewise, so this is where it might be confusing because it sounds almost like it's two different things, the way your translations have it. So Balaam taught Balak to put a stumbling block before Israel by, by basically convincing them to partake in worship of idols and to partake in sexual immorality. The Greek says, likewise, there are those who follow the doctrine of the Nicolaitans. Meaning, this is likely what the doctrine of the Nicolaitans is. The Nicolaitans are likely antinomians. And, and what is an antinomian? Not lawless. Yeah, it's really self-law. So it's against, literally you can say it's against the law of God, but it's not against any law. People just put their own law. Remember, what's the phrase? I've said this a million times. It's really important. I want you to get it. I want, I want it to click. What is the phrase that describes the wicked man in the Bible? He does evil whenever he gets a chance and he loves it. Is that what it says? What does it say of the evil man? Exactly. He does what is right in his own eyes. He has his own law. That is an antinomian. An antinomian replaces Christ's law with his law. So he does what he thinks is right. We have a bunch of antinomians in our culture who would call themselves Christians. And whatever you do, don't break the social justice law that they made up when it comes to LGBTQ+, plus all that stuff, because you're an evil person then. That's their law they made up. They would call themselves Christians. That's not God's law, though. God's law is that, well, all that's wicked, and you would condemn it. Um, completely different. So these people are antinomians, and what they're doing is they're teaching other Christians that those legalistic fundies who are saying that you can't partake in the celebrations and eat food with pagans. I mean, Jesus ate with sinners. Come on, people. And sex is a good thing that God made. We should be able to share it with everybody. You should be able to do that, partake in it or whatever. Those, those legalists, they don't understand the gospel and it's about grace and we're just saved by grace. They don't get it. That's the argument of the antinomian. The antinomian has misunderstood grace. He does what Jude says, 
that these people who claim to know Lord, the Lord Jesus do. They deny him by their works and they turn the grace of our Lord Jesus into licentiousness. That is, according to their senses, whatever they feel is right and wrong. They become the arbiters of truth and good rather than God's law. Did Jesus come to get rid of God's law? He came to fulfill the righteousness of the law so that he could restore us to God. But does that mean it's like, ah, I don't care if you're like the character of God anymore then? No, obviously he wants you to now become like him, right? And we're going to see that in the text here as well. So it's really important. What, what these teachers are doing then is they're preaching. It's okay to kind of syncretize the religion of Christianity with false religion. It's all right. There's no problem with that. Uh, we're just trying to combine ourselves and kind of get along with the world. And, hey, maybe we can be a better witness that way. And they're combining the ethics of Christianity with the ethics of the world and actually end up rejecting biblical ethics. Specifically when it comes to sex, but obviously, as we talked before, those two stand as the, maybe the, uh, the uh, titles or the, the top categories of all theology and ethics that would, they would represent. So this is moral compromise and it's theological compromise. It's, it's, it's compromise in terms of worship. Therefore, repent. If not, I will come to you soon. And that's the word take again. I will come to you suddenly, quickly, before you know it. I will come to you suddenly and... Uh, and war against them with the sword of my mouth. Notice he doesn't say, I'm going to war against you. He understands that maybe, because it doesn't say that they're not doing anything about this group. It just says that this group is among them. Maybe they've tried to talk to these people. Maybe they're trying to teach these people and they're just in rebellion. So he says, I'm going to come to you, but I'm going to make war with them. So, so it's interesting here because the rest of the church is he kind of just warns that I'm going to take out your whole church if you don't repent. But here it seems he's just saying, I'm going to split you and I'm going to take out those who aren't really in my church, but the rest of you I'm going to keep. I'm not going to war against you. It says something similar actually in, in uh, the uh, church of Thyatira. Um, he who has an ear... Let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches, meaning this is not really just for this specific church. It just represents all the churches that Christ is speaking to and warning, uh, and warning that they need to repent. To the one who conquers, I will give some of the hidden manna. What does it mean to conquer? I want our church to get this because I hear so much confusion about it. Persevere in terms of what? Yeah. Right. If I have a hundred acres of land and I've turned them into just a Christian paradise and, uh, and I have the best run family in the entire church and I have the best buildings and I produce the best beer for the town, and I just do everything. But Domitian comes and takes it all away and kills my family and uh, takes my beer and all of that. Have I overcome? Because I have stood up to him and said, I, I, will, I will not deny the Lord Jesus Christ. Is that what overcoming means in the book of Revelation in the Bible? then being victorious is not, I take over the world. Not here. He just referred to a guy who lost his life. How did he take over the world? Yeah, by dying through the gospel, right? But he didn't win. Not in our worldly sense. He didn't win. Most Christians under Domitian have their land taken away. Most of them. Uh, John probably might even have land. He's, it's taken away, and he's thrown it over to Patmos. He's, he's exiled. A lot of them are killed. That's seen as victory in the mind of Christ. You've won. So this is what I don't like, right? I don't like the post-millennial the post 
Uh, every other theology is a theology of defeat. That's garbage. And I also don't like the John MacArthur, we lose down here. That's garbage. That's not true. We win down here, but winning is defined differently by the Bible. It's not, I get all the government buildings and I get to now make the laws. That's not necessarily winning in the Bible. In fact, we had that from a bunch of people who claim to be Christian in Europe for about a thousand years. And in my estimation, knowing their personal lives, they were losers. They weren't winning, but they had everything and they turned everything into what they thought was a Christian culture, which ended up not being really, but um, this is winning. You die, you have your stuff taken away. You lose in the world's eyes. Isn't that what Jesus actually says? Isn't that what our Lord actually taught? If you lose your life, you'll gain it. Not if you gain your life, then you'll gain some more, and then you can just win all around. Right. Right. But he totally lost in the eyes of many people because he didn't have like a million acres of land when he died. And he didn't have tons of children that took it over and all that sort of thing. Now, spiritually, he did. Like, there, there's a point where we need to understand in Joe 9 theology, I think, that I hear dismissed by people all the time. When Christ says to Pilate, my kingdom is not of this world, this is what he means. There is an already not yet theology in John. The already does not include the physical. That's a misunderstanding of the already. The already is spiritual. That's why those who hear my voice, they come alive. What is he talking about? In John chapter 5, regeneration. Those who hear my voice, a time is coming and now is, he says, in the present. So in the future and in the present... A time, this is the time where people will hear my voice and come alive. But a time is coming, and he doesn't say it's present. It's not now where they'll hear my voice, and those who are in the tombs will come out of them. That's the physical. When does the world turn back? When does it stop being futile to where we just live and die and it can't support our lives anymore? What is it groaning for? It's groaning for the revelation of the sons of God, which Paul says is the resurrection of the body. So it will not turn back. It will not give up its futility until that point. It's very... Very important for you to understand this. I know it probably doesn't seem like a big deal to you, but your children need to understand that so they don't, don't turn around and say, you know what, I thought Jesus is going to have us win and we're not. We're all losing and we're all dying. So is really Jesus real and I'm dying for nothing? You're going to hurt the faith of your children who are going to die in this country. I promise you. I promise you. Again, plant your apple tree, buy the vineyard, make paradise on earth, but that's not winning, not yet. And you'll get it back in the resurrection. You'll have the new heavens and new earth. What you plant here, I think that you get back. So definitely plant here. But don't expect to win in that way down here. That's not the way we win. To the one who conquers, to the one who's victorious in the way that John sang, I will give some of the hidden manna and I will give him a bright stone. What, what is manna? That's the, what, what actually sustains your life, right? Obviously, it's talking about eternal life here. The bright stone is a reference to later on in the book where you have the city of Jerusalem made out of all these jewels, all these bright stones, sparkling stones. So in other words, to the one who is victorious in this way, that's the guy who actually is going to be saved. 
And then he says, with a new name written on the stone that no one knows except the one who receives it. What does the name represent in the Bible? Yeah, the person of some, someone, right? The char- character, person. So what, what will you receive if you are victorious? The character of Christ. You're going to also see that throughout the book as well. The white robes that the saints are given, you would think, like if I was an evangelical, I would be like, oh, the white robes, that's the robes of Christ. He just gives them to you. Uh, and the book says that. Look, you can drink from the waters freely without cost. That's the gospel. It's very clear. But the white robes re- reference your character. And the Bible actually says the white robes are the good deeds of the saints. That if you overcome in this world, you'll be conformed to the image of Jesus Christ and you'll be like him and your reward will be being like him. In other words, what God wants to do with you is make you fit for that world to come. He doesn't want a bunch of wicked people who are chaotic, who are going to ruin the world to come. So he's making you right now into people that belong in that world. Which is why the antinomian who comes along and says, yeah, you know, we're all sinners. And, and it just it's so good that we know Jesus because now we, we don't have to worry about becoming holy and doing what's right. Completely misunderstands the plan of God, which is to save you through the gospel so that you deny all ungodliness and become like Jesus Christ and become fit for the world to come. You look right in that world. That world is a crown, and he's making you a jewel to put in that crown. That's why it's important to be discipled. That's why it's important to go to church and to go to Bible study. That's why. Because you need to become that person. So no, it's not good to go off and blow off Bible study and go down to the bar because that's where all the sinners are because that's what Jesus would do. Jesus is here walking amongst us, walking amongst the lampstands, amongst his people. All right, any questions on that church, on Pergamum? All right, let's go to the next. And to the angel of the church in Thyatira, right? The words of the Son of God, who has eyes like a flame of fire and whose feet are like burnished bronze. I know your works, your love and faith and service and patient endurance, and that your latter works, the works you do now, are actually even greater than the the preceding works. They're even better. Now, if you were to read that of our church, I bet you would be like, that's everything. Awesome. We're we're great. I mean, listen to what he says. Your works are good. Your love. So they don't have the problem of the Ephesian church. Your love is good. You put Christ as, as the top priority and you put one another as top priority. Good job. You serve Christ. You serve one another. You have the faith. So you've, you've got the theology down, you have the faith, and you are committed, and you endure patiently when you are afflicted through the persecution, through trials. Excellent work. I would think that that's the whole Christian life right there. Good job. But I have this against you. What does he have against them? Yeah, do you know what the word tolerate there is in the Greek? I hate the word, the translation tolerate. Do you know what the word actually is? It's aphiemi, which means forgiveness. You forgive the woman Jezebel. Again, this is an antinomian misunderstanding of the gospel to where the gospel is believe in Jesus, but you don't need to repent. This woman is not repentant, and yet the church forgives her. Because again, hey, we're all sinners, right? So what he has against them is what? What does the Ephesian church do that they're not doing? What did he say? Do you guys remember? It's the very first church, the Ephesian church. Church discipline. He says of the Ephesian church, you do not tolerate evil people. 
And he's like, good job. Excellent. I want to show you here, this is really important. If you have everything together as a church, but you don't practice church discipline, you're under the judgment of Christ as a church. That's really important. We think church discipline is like some extra thing that churches do. Christ is saying, you can have all that other stuff, but if you don't practice church discipline, you're not really a real church, and I'm going to take you out of my invisible church. Now, let me say this to you as a Christian individually in the church. If you don't support church discipline, the same thing goes for you. Are you a Christian? Now, you can misunderstand it. You can be young and trying to grow into understanding. That's fine. If you don't support it, if you speak against it, I'm going to say, I don't think you're a real Christian either. Because Christ doesn't consider you a real church, a Christian church. If you were a genuine Christian, he wouldn't say, oh, I'm going to kick you guys out. Likewise, I would say that for everything else. If you are a church that doesn't have good doctrine, you're not, you're, you're not a real church if you don't repent. If you're a church that teaches antinomianism, you're not a real church unless you repent. Well, that just excludes the majority of churches in Vegas. Most of them are antinomian. But I would also then say you're not a real church if you're not practicing church discipline, which means that also excludes the vast majority of churches in Las Vegas. And again, likewise, as a Christian, if you don't support sound doctrine, you're not really a Christian. If you don't support Christian ethics, I don't mean your ethics, Christian ethics, you're not really a Christian. If you're telling people to compromise when they have persecution, when they have pressure, oh no, I could get fired from the school system, or I could get fired from the government job I have, I could get fired from this or that, you're actually doing something that is satanic, and if you don't repent, I'm going to say you're not a real Christian. And if you speak against church discipline, I don't mean when it's fault badly done, I mean like in general, I'm going to say you're not a Christian in the same way that Christ says you're not a real Christian church. Now, if you don't repent, let me make that real clear. Everybody can sin, right? That's a different issue. Jesse? Well, the, the word is to forgive. They, they translate it as tolerate. Sure. Yeah. Right. Like what, what actually, like, like, paint a picture. Like, was, was this woman, like, up on the Temple Mount doing prostitution and, like, coming to church? Like, what, what, what way was she, like, not repenting verbally, not repenting physically? She was repenting verbally and then go back and do the things. Like, what, what did this look like? Well, the last time I talked to her, uh, <laughs> here's, here's what I think, given what we know of the early church, given the fact that he just commended them for the fact that they hold to the faith and that they actually do hold to Christian ethics and all that, she's not someone who's an elder. She's someone in the church claiming to have a prophetic gift, which we've seen, we see that in our own church, frankly, here and there. People claiming that they have some, they may not say they're a prophet or prophetess, but they'll claim some sort of supernatural power. And that's why I know the elders are wrong because I have this spiritual gift that tells me. It's like, oh, okay. Um, is that exegesis? Because that's what we really want to <laughs> see. Um, so what it, what it looks like is you actually have a pretty solid church with a, a group running around teaching their own stuff who are not being dealt with by the elders. So you have a, they're great otherwise, but the elders are not disciplining these people who are teaching their own thing. And their own thing is not just, I'm post-mill, I'm pre-mill. That's, that's not, their own thing is antinomianism, which is a contrary, contrary Christianity. It's not a real Christianity. It's a false gospel. It's a completely different religion. Um, and he uses the terminology that to actually follow this woman is adultery, which again, spiritual adultery is what? It happens when you combine two religions together. So Christ right here is saying that antinomianism is not a version of Christianity. It's a different religion. It's actually part of the Roman religion of the beast. 
and the church has actually partaken of it. So she's bringing the, she is like the false prophet later on who's bringing in the world's religions into Christianity. And she does that by theology, thinking that you can use idols in Christianity. And then through the ethics, thinking that you can actually partake in things that are wicked according to the Bible. Because you have a newfound, you know, we're all about love. That's all, all the false prophets. I'm about love. What do all the false ministers say about like the LGBTQ stuff from the pulpit? God's about love, people. How can you be against love? And we understand that love is that which pushes you to the character of Jesus Christ, that which pushes you to eternity, that which makes you a person who belongs in the world to come. That's what love does. Love doesn't make you so ugly that you're rejected and thrown into the lake of fire by God. That's not what love does. So love has an expression through the morality of God's law, not through your made-up law. <laughs> What's love got to do with it? Um, are you really asking me that? or Was that, was that just... Okay, all right. All right. Right. <laughs> so, yeah, did you have anything else to add to that? Just Is there something else that you picture this as kind of happening in the background or whatever? Or? Well, he said he says very explicitly she she has not repented. Right. So I don't I don't know if she would have verbally repented, or if they were just or if these elders just have a misunderstanding of the gospel in terms of, well, she believes in Jesus, so we have to consider her a Christian. Yeah, and that phrase like I gave her time to repent. Right. Like, okay, we're warning you. Like, yeah, I think I think that's the talking. Yeah. I think that's the the elders have warned her said hey this is not Christianity. But at the end of the day, they have a weak understanding of when you give forgiveness. Remember, these are early Christians. They don't necessarily understand that, you know, especially in the antinomian, you know, siege of the church, I would say, in the first century. Um, they might think that all you need to do is believe in Jesus and you're fine. This is why so much of the New Testament is written against that idea, because I think it's so prominent. So... Um, I think what's probably happening is they see her not repenting, but they're kind of like, well, she's a Christian and they're not going to deal with it. And Christ is saying, well, then I'm going to deal with it because <laughs> I want my church pure. Yeah, right. Yeah, and so that that's very pertinent, right? I mean, it's again, it, I think it's everywhere. It's everywhere in the New Testament. But remember, a lot of these churches, they have some of the New Testament. They have a lot of prophets telling them, filling in the gaps or whatever. Um, and it's easy. And some of them know it; they know it really well. And then others seem to be easily swayed by the antinomian heresy um, that's going on. I think they were at all swayed by the fact that she was calling herself a prophet. Oh, absolutely. Because there are real prophets in the early church. So, I mean, if someone says, yeah, I have the gift of prophecy, and all they have to do is maybe, you know, tell you a few things about yourself, and, you know, I perceive that you like pizza. Is that right? And you had a father. I'm seeing you had a father. Yes? I mean, you know, some of that nonsense. They did that in the first century, too. But it also could be demonic. Yeah, it could be real information. It could, you know. But either way, this is how she gets her authority, and she gets people to follow her. Christ says, I'm going to come, I'm throwing her on a bed, uh, meaning th this, is, this is a play on words because normally you fornicate and commit adultery on a bed, but obviously he's throwing her on a bed, meaning he's going to make her sick and basically kill her. And then he says, I'm going to kill all her children as well. So, but it's interesting. I want you to pick this up. But then he says, 
if they don't repent. So he says he gave her a long time to repent. He's going to throw her on a bed of illness. He's going to kill all her children. But he's still, if they repent, he's going to be, okay. He's going to take it. That's how patient our Lord is. There's no man that's patient like that. No human would give you all this time to repent. You be obstinate and stubborn and say, okay, well, I'm, I'm bringing the hammer down. And then you're like, okay, I repent. Like, okay, I forgive you then. The patience of the Lord is amazing. People who follow her, yeah, not, not, not physical children. I don't think that's, I mean, obviously I think they would be included with her, but that's not really mentioned here or anything. Right, yeah, I think that's the idea. Right. Well, and yeah, if you understand this within the federal headship idea, which I think they would have understood really clearly, that's why Christ is calling them her children, meaning her fate will be their fate. Um, again, unless they repent. All right, um, the application for our church, we've kind of been already talking about, which is what I want to encourage you in and what he's going to encourage them in. He's going to say, but to the rest of you in Thyatira who do not hold this teaching, who have not learned what some call the deep things of Satan, to you I say, I do not lay on you any other burden. So if you're doing what's right, you want these people disciplined. It's the fault of the basically elders not doing it. It's these, or it's just the fault of these people just not listening to the elders. As Jesse said, it could be either one. Um, whatever the case is, you actually want a pure church. You want all that. Christ has no beef with you. As long as you are following in the faith and love and serving one another and enduring under trials, you're doing what Christians should do. And you're supporting church discipline. You're good. So that's why he says to them only, this is the only thing he, he requires of them, hold fast what you have until I come. In other words, don't think, oh, I'm good, now I can slack. Hold on to it, keep persevering in it, let your works continue and increase in that regard. Um, let your faith increase, your love increase, your service to one another, your service to Christ increase, your patience in, in trials increase. Yeah. Right. Or you guys need to like go start a new church. Yeah. Or something like that. Yeah. He doesn't say that. He just says, hold fast to what you know. Right. And you're good. Yeah. That's what Christ is. Well, it is it is interesting that Christ's address of a bad church is repent and those of you who are actually doing good, keep doing good, and you you counter the bad culture where you are. Don't leave. That's not the issue. And I mean, it'd be absurd anyway. It's like, oh, well, go, you're at Pergamum. All right, well, go to the church at Thyatira then. That's a much better. It's like, no, they have the same problem. Well, how easy would it have been for them to just move right back? Right. Their time. Yeah, because of the Pax Romana, they, they can move anywhere, right? They can just, they can do that. Um, yeah, no, it's, it's, you are, God has you are where you are for a reason, and he wants you to persevere here and be a witness to other Christians here and cultivate here um, a good church. So how do we understand, like I, I grew up in a more, um, like Southern Baptist, more even go, even spent time in Assemblies of God, where you like, God's calling me to this church, God's calling me to like always try to figure out where God's calling you so you can keep that call and go. Yeah. And that's been most of my life, I was just, yeah. Right. Million times. So, like, how do you? When would it? When would you say? Or would you say there's ever a time where you need to leave a church? Well, let me, let me back up one step and just say there's no such thing, unless God is audibly saying it to you. That's what the calling is in the Bible. It's an audible thing. So the call of the gospel is a verbal, audible thing. Uh, the call of a prophet is God literally saying, "Hey, I'm calling you. I want you to do this." You can hear the voice of God. Um, there's no such thing as a calling. There's always this thing of like, oh, there's an inward calling. It's like, where are you getting that in the Bible? 
Um, now, if you want to call the desire to do ministry an inward calling, okay, but it's not really the way the Bible uses the terminology. So the reason why I say that is because there's a million people who entered ministry or did this or that because they thought God was calling them to do it. And all it was is them thinking of that. And, and a lot of guys who enter ministry, they're not qualified according to the Bible, but they have a calling. And it's like, well, that's, that doesn't qualify you or whatever, whether you think you have a calling or not. Let's, ch let's check the scripture to see if that's you know, accurate. Now, is there a time to leave a church? Yeah, of course. I think when the church, I think... The only time you should leave a church, obviously there's other reasons if you like your job calls you away or whatever, but, but I mean, because you think that church is bad is when you have understood that Christ has pulled the lampstand from that church. If Christ has pulled the lampstand, there's no church there anymore. But until that time, you should be all in. And that we have failed to do as Americans. We are consumers and we're looking to buy the best church we can. And if this isn't the best church, then I'm going to move to a place that has a better store and a better church, and I'll buy that church. Well, did that initially start with um, the um, uh, listing of the Word of God? In terms of the calling idea? No, no. That in terms of... Oh, there's a lampstand? Yeah. Not necessarily. This is what I want you to pay attention. It, not necessarily. Everyone's always on the doctrine, right? But but if you look at this, it's it's not just always on the doctrine. So if they're tolerating sin, <clears throat> if they're tolerating sin, if they're teaching antinomianism, if their ethics, or they're teaching basically just if they're teaching ethics that are flat outright contrary to Christian ethics, and they won't repent. I mean, like after long talks, long you know, you're in it, you're trying to get it to to repent and, and continue on. After long talks, they're just continuing on. They're like, no, nah, we're going to say, we're going to do the Andy Stanley, Stanley thing and say, you know, uh, yeah, gay, gay Christians are a thing. It's like, okay, well, I don't believe you have a lampstand here if, if you did it all there. I don't know, but. This picture, though, is kind of saying, like, Jezebel Christians are a thing, right? Yeah. Like, so, like, on the one hand, like, maybe you can clarify, because it seems like you're saying that there's major ethical problems that would be a reason to leave That continue to where there's no repentance. And to where the, the whole church is actually in that. Yeah. So where, where, in other words, if it's clear that you, you you're going to know if Christ has pulled the lampstand because the spirit of God is not going to be speaking the word there anymore. It's going to be um, compromises left and right on theology and ethics. I mean, eventually it, it becomes a denial of everything. But in the beginning, it's just like one thing. It's one thing that the devil uses to get his foot in the door. Now, when he's fully in the house, you're going to know it because then everything's going to go by the wayside because he can't tolerate truth and he can't tolerate the character of Christ and he can't tolerate a discipline of evil and he can't tolerate anyone putting up with the persecutions he throws at him. Um, so all that stuff's going to go out the window. And that's when you know the lampstand is gone and you need to move on. <laughs> right. That you could just see. <laughs> but th th think of the Corinthian church, right? Th think of the Corinthian church, how bad the Corinthian church is. Hey guys, stop sleeping with prostitutes. Um, stop tolerating the incestuous uh, unions that you got here going on. Uh, stop uh, getting drunk on the communion and stealing from the poor. And, you know, maybe, you know, this is a little, little bit to ask, but may maybe actually care about other people. And yet, Paul never says to the people at Corinth who aren't really the church. He says to the holy ones at Corinth, to those elect by God. So it's still a church. So I'm just saying, man, your church better be spiritually devastated to where you know the judgment, the, the sword have, has come out of Christ's mouth and leveled that church before you say, I'm going to go. Now, if it's not an Orthodox church to begin with, I'd be like, well, there's no lampstand there. I mean, if you're like in a Mormon church, then yeah, I mean, you know, that's not a church. It's got to be an apostolic church in the first place, right? That's, that's the whole point, but. The one who conquers, again, the one who conquers in this way, by holding fast to all these things, that's how you conquer and who keeps my works until the end, to him I will give authority over the nations, 
and he will rule them with a rod of iron. Now notice that, like, you've been oppressed by this government that's, that's even killing you guys, but if you persevere in your character of Christ and doing all these things, holding fast to them, you're going to be the one who rules one day, because I'm going to rule, and I'm going to give you my rule so that you rule. So this will not be the eternal state for you. This will not always be. This is for a little while. Um, and I will give him the morning star. What does that mean? Christ is called the bright morning star later. What is this referring to? Well, what what is it? Uh, well, yeah, kind of. Um, think think of a star and the brilliance of the star. What would that represent? Maybe. Yeah. What. Well, yeah, well, it would be glory, righteous. It was. It would be glory, basically. The idea of the brill- the beauty that is Christ, which we'll see in chapters four and five, which is the beauty of God, will become your beauty. You will become beautiful. You're not beautiful right now. I hate to break it to you. Many of you are beautiful on the outside, but we're we're not beautiful people. We have sin still. We're, we don't look like we should. We're not like God. We don't reflect Him the way we should. But Christ's promise to us is persevere, keep going. I'm going to make you beautiful. You're going to have the beauty that I have. I'm going to give you my beauty, which is God's beauty. And you'll be beautiful eternally. And you'll be fit then for that world to come. Yeah. Okay, so... In Isaiah, um, some people think that passage is talking about Satan. I personally don't. Uh, I think Jeff does. I don't know if Drake does or not. I haven't, I haven't. He's the king of, uh... well, it, it, well, I think everybody agrees it's the king of Babylon, right? But, but whether it's also referring to Satan is, is a question. Um, in there, it refers to Venus. It calls whoever it is Venus because of their glory, because of the, the, the glory that they have, the majesty and all that. Um, so whether it's referring to Satan, it could refer to Satan that he had majesty beforehand. That, I mean, I, I don't mind buying into that. It sounds like it would be true. Um, but Christ is the bright morning star, and mo- the morning star really just represents glory in general, regardless of who has it. <clears throat> so Christ is saying, I'm going to give you my glory. In the same way, in the, in, the, in the previous thing, he said, I'm going to give you my name, right? You're going to have the new name. I'm going to give you my throne. The Father gave me this throne. I'm, I'm going to give you my throne. You're receiving everything that Christ has received. He who has an ear here, let him hear what the Spirit says, again, plural, to the churches. Um, okay, I'll, I'll, mention, I'll mention something in the text later that I didn't mention unless you guys have a question about it, but... But that's what I want you really to take away from this is ultimately this is our promise and hope. It's going to be in the Lord Jesus Christ. It's going to be partaking in his beauty. And that's why we don't want to live ugly now. And those who teach an antinomian gospel are telling you it's okay to live ugly. And Christ is coming and saying, no, that's not why I washed you. I washed you and made you clean so that you could become beautiful, not ugly. Don't listen to false prophets who tell you otherwise. Comments, questions? I was just thinking about, um, you know, kind of hold fast. That whole, you know, the whole thing, is, you know, stand firm on the rock. That's it. That's just it. Because when we are faced with trial, persecution, whatever, our, our flesh wants to run. Yeah. Yeah. It's it's really the it's the pressure of the world. Um and it's not just pressure from hey, I'm going to kill you if you don't deny Christ. It's like I may be weary from obeying Christ because my life is so hard. And I just am like, man, I'm just tired and that's what Christ is saying, "Hey, hold on. This is a short time compared to what I'm going to give you. It's nothing. Paul says the, you know, the sufferings of this world, they're nothing in comparison 
to what he's actually preserved for us, Christ is just saying, hold on, just wait and see. It is, it's only a little while. Um, it, it seems forever to us because it's all we've known is this short little period. But obviously the eternal God is saying your life is nothing compared to what I've prepared for you. Yeah. Yeah, the word akuo throughout John has kind of a double meaning often, which is not just hearing something, but actually hearing and obeying it, listening to it. And if you remember, the beginning of the book is all about that, right? The person who actually hears these words, obeys, and keeps them. Um, so that's the idea. Because everyone can hear what's being said and be like, eh, I'm not going to do that. Or they can say, yeah, I'm totally going to do that, and then they don't. Um, so it actually is saying, he who has actually given that by the Spirit of God, and only the Spirit can give you that, the ability to obey, um, let him obey it. I had this exact conversation with Jillian today mm. about LGBTQ mm. and how they have framed what they're doing to be something it isn't, which is love. Right. And it's the yeah. standard of what love is. Their definition of what love is. Yeah. Right. And so they think what they're doing is right and good. Yeah. But in Genesis it says that God is creational. And right. Everything that he has created is good. Well, we talked about this in First Corinthians too, right? Like whatever love is, it produces life. Yes. And I said, can two men right. produce anything? Yeah. Can two women? Right. No. So then they can't be creational. Yeah. And that's what our God is, is creation. Yeah. Right. Again, I can't believe we're discussing this today. <laughs> yeah. Wild. Yeah. Yeah. Well, j again, it's just, it's it, we are the Roman Empire. We have churches like they had churches, and and our biggest heresy, I think, today in our country is antinomianism. I think that's the biggest problem. I don't think it's legalism. I'm sh there are legalistic churches. That's true. They're usually underground. They're not big. They're not the big mega churches. Nobody wants to go to them except for people who are probably mentally ill in some way. Or they just get caught for whatever reason. They're, they don't know better and they get caught in these cults or whatever. But that's not our big problem. Our big problem is the mega churches and the antinomianism. That's our big problem in Christianity in America. Wasn't legalism in I think legalism is more than the 19th century. You have a lot in the 19th century. A lot of, that's why a lot of cults pop up in the 19th century. You have a lot in the early 20th century. Once evangelicalism comes on the scene, it starts to die out and you have much more antinomianism. Now, you could always identify something as legalism to where anytime people makes, make up a rule that someone has to obey that isn't biblical, um, that is anti-biblical, I would say, or it's just adding to the scripture, I would say maybe that's legalistic. So we do have legalistic tendencies, but not to the threat of undermining, I think, Christianity and the gospel that antinomianism is in our country. I mean, all you have to do is get on Facebook and, and tell Christians that they should do this or that, right? It's over at that point. You're just, you're a legalist because in their minds, Christians don't have to do anything because they believe in Jesus. Love. Right. Oh. Uh, he does not think the morning star is... is uh, <laughs> oh, he doesn't. Uh, the, well, because... The, the, no, 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 not in Revelation. At all? Well, I asked in Isaiah. He's, he's answering right now. But oh, okay. I thought he did in Isaiah. Not, not, he doesn't believe in... Re Everybody understands in Revelation it's Jesus. Yeah, yeah, no. Yeah, right. I'll give you the devil. Uh, no, that's not, that's not what I meant. No, 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 no. No, I, I thought he just believed in Isaiah that that was talking about. Uh, the devil. Does he not believe that now? He's tight. Oh, okay. All right, we'll find the answer in a minute. <laughs> yeah. Right. Yep. Yeah, yes. No, I, I think that is it. I, I think that well, are you talking about like like the Jezebel religion and the Nicolaitans? It's like this counterfeit Christianity. Is that what you mean, or? Well, partly, but also just all throughout Scripture, we see that it's, it's. I mean, please, you know, correct me if I'm wrong, but it seems like Satan is always using things that are a counterfeit to Christ. Right. So even maybe the Morning Star. I don't know. I'm just 
Oh, yeah, sure, yeah. Oh, well, well, I mean, regardless of how you take Isaiah, Paul even says this, right? The angel, the, the, the devil appears as an angel of light, right? So this brilliance type thing. Um, and Jeff's going through 2 Kings right now, and that's that's absolutely true. What, what do you have in 2 Kings? You've got the counterfeit religion of Yahweh, which is with the golden calves, and then the combination of the Baals and all of that. So the devil always has it, not just in the world, but actually among us. It's always in the church. It's always been in Israel. And God actually says in the law, the reason why I put that among you is because I want to test you. I want to see if you're going to be faithful. So, I, so God actually wants it among us for us to, to see how we're going to deal with it. Are we going to discipline? Are we going to uh, counter it? Are we going to teach what's right? Are we going to cave to the pressures of it? So yeah, no, I, I think you're right. There's always a counterfeit and, and it's always among us, I think. What do you say? He said uh, uh, Isaiah is Satan. <laughs> <laughs> this is me and Isaiah is Satan. Right. Yeah, well, that, that's what I was trying to say. That, that's what I was trying to say, that, that he believes the Isaiah passage. Not Reve- Revelation is clear. And we said, all would said, agree. He said Revelation is Jesus. Yeah, everybody would agree. Revelations, the, the, the morning star there is Christ. That's actually, it's a fallacy. I don't know if you guys are familiar with like Gail Ripplinger who had this whole KJV oh, yeah. thing. It's a fallacy sometimes these people make, and they're like, well, the Bible says the morning star is Satan. So Revelation, you know, the modern translations, they're saying that Jesus is Satan. And it's like, that is like the worst word study fallacy, like, ever. That's basically just saying that, like, Satan can appear beautiful. Jesus is beautiful. Oh, well, Jesus must be Satan. It's like, no. You can call many things beautiful. <laughs> but, but it is interesting that Jesus is called the bright morning star, as though... His beauty and brilliance just is far above everyone and everything else's. And again, we're going to see that in chapters 4 and 5, that God ultimately and Jesus Christ are beautiful, beauty themselves. Well, let's end here because that's going to be a long discussion and it won't really have to do with, with this or whatever. Um, so let's go ahead and end in a word of prayer. Jesse, you want to pray for us? All right, thanks, guys.